Hello, everybody. This is Rob Swatsky from the York Campus of Hack. And in this podcast, we'll be focusing on muscle metabolism and take a look at the different ways that muscle fibers can supply ATP to power their contraction. Muscle fibers are extremely energy-dependent cells. When they are busy contracting, they consume large amounts of ATP very quickly. Contracting muscle fibers can use about 2 million ATP molecules every single second. The amount of ATP inside a muscle fiber at any given moment can maintain only several seconds of contraction. ATP is needed by muscle fibers primarily to begin the contraction cycle and to pump calcium ions back into the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, during relaxation. In order to power extended periods of muscle contraction, ATP production is a continuous job of the muscle fibers and they have several ways of making more ATP. Muscle fibers can make ATP from creatine phosphate by anaerobic glycolysis and through the reactions of aerobic cellular respiration. Creatine phosphate is an abundant high energy chemical molecule found only in muscle fibers. It is made from the excess ATP found in resting muscle fibers. During relaxation, there is always a surplus of extra ATP made in the fibers that is not used because the fibers are not engaged in contraction. They're just carrying out their basic resting metabolic processes which don't consume as much ATP compared to muscle contraction. Creatine phosphate is made when creatine, a molecule produced by the liver and abundant in muscle fibers with a structure similar to an amino acid, is phosphorylated and it gains a high energy phosphate group from ATP through the actions of an enzyme called creatine kinase, or CK for short. As ATP is used during muscle contraction, the amount of ADP in the muscle fiber increases. The phosphate group on creatine phosphate can now be transferred to ADP with the help of creatine kinase, rapidly creating more ATP for immediate use in muscle contraction. Think of creatine phosphate as a temporary holder of phosphate holding on to it and releasing it to ADP to recharge the molecule into making more ATP when needed. Because of the rapid speed of ATP formation from creatine phosphate, it is the primary energy source that fuels the beginning of muscle contraction. Creatine phosphate is able to fuel short, intense bursts of energy such as running after a bus or sprinting, and is able to sustain a maximum contraction of about 15 seconds. As creatine phosphate runs out, the muscle fiber has to have another source of ATP to allow muscle contraction to continue. This next source comes from the monosaccharide sugar glucose, which moves into muscle fibers from the blood by facilitated diffusion. Muscle fibers can also obtain glucose by breaking down the polysaccharide glycogen, which is stored up inside the fibers. The reactions of glycolysis then occur in the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber, which breaks down one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, also called pyruvic acid, and produces a net gain of two molecules of ATP. Unlike aerobic respiration, which requires the presence of oxygen gas, glycolysis can occur quickly with or without oxygen. During prolonged exercise, muscle fibers are unable to get as much oxygen as they need during anaerobic conditions. In these situations, anaerobic glycolysis occurs where glucose is broken down through glycolysis, but the pyruvic acids that are produced are converted into the waste product lactic acid and then diffuse into the bloodstream. As the blood flows into the liver, 
liver cells can convert some of the lactic acid back into glucose and help increase the pH of the blood by making it less acidic. During extended bouts of strenuous, intense muscle activity, lactic acid can build up in the muscle fiber and the blood, which contributes to muscle soreness. Anaerobic glycolysis can supply the muscle with enough energy for about two minutes of maximum contraction. Oxygen can move into muscle fibers through direct diffusion from the blood and through its release from myoglobin, which is an oxygen binding protein similar to hemoglobin found inside the muscle fibers themselves. If during longer periods of muscle contraction there is enough oxygen available, the pyruvic acid produced from glycolysis is not converted to lactic acid and instead moves into the muscle fibers mitochondria where it enters into the oxygen dependent reactions of aerobic cellular respiration. These reactions are slower than anaerobic glycolysis but can make more ATP from glucose, so they are more efficient. There is a lot more bang for the metabolic buck, so to speak, where one molecule of glucose in aerobic cellular respiration can be broken down into 30 or 32 molecules of ATP. Not only can pyruvic acid enter the mitochondria, but also amino acids from protein digestion and fatty acids from adipose tissue can be used by the mitochondria to make ATP. Aerobic respiration can supply enough ATP to sustain activities lasting from several minutes to hours. Muscle fatigue occurs when muscle tissue cannot generate enough of a force of contraction after sustained activity. During exercise, the first warning signs of muscle fatigue occur in the form of central fatigue, that point when you begin feeling tired and want to stop working out. Muscle fatigue is thought to be caused by the interplay of several factors. First, the sarcoplasmic reticulum are not releasing enough calcium ions into the sarcoplasm, which we know are needed to help trigger the contraction cycle. Also, the drop in creatine phosphate during muscle activity, low oxygen levels, low glycogen levels, low nutrient levels, low acetylcholine levels, and high lactic acid buildup, as well as ADP accumulation, are other factors that lead to muscle fatigue. When we stop exercising, both our respiration rates and oxygen consumption continue at rates higher than our normal resting levels. These elevated rates may last from several minutes to several hours after exercise. The amount of added oxygen that is taken into the body after exercise, above what is normally consumed at rest, has traditionally been called oxygen debt but is more appropriately referred to as recovery oxygen uptake. Think of this extra oxygen as what is used to replace or pay back metabolism in order for it to recover and return to resting conditions. This extra oxygen is used to convert lactic acid back into glycogen in the liver, produce more creatine phosphate and ATP in muscle fibers, and replace oxygen that was released by myoglobin. 